yes, their muscles might relax, but then they have no occlusion because, you know, I used to meet here. Now, if you just adjust that, and now if you just adjust that, and then suddenly you're through the enamel, ouch, that hurts. Equilibration should never be, never go through the enamel, never, okay? If the equilibration has to go through that enamel, you finally have to chop a large amount off a tooth, you should consider orthodontics, or you should consider additive reconstruction to the whole occlusion. You shouldn't need to adjust three, four millimeters off a tooth. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Equilibration is just one of those really controversial topics within occlusion and within dentistry in general, right? It can really split a room. Like the other day on Facebook and on the Telegram group, when I asked you guys, which episode do you want next? And I suggested we can have one about equilibration. Uh, my buddy Saranga said, hey, we still we still do equilibration. I, I, th I thought we didn't do equilibration anymore. And I remember attending a BDA event I think I was maybe one year qualified and Professor, actually I was a dentist student and Professor Robert Ibbotson, who was there, you know, very experienced uh, towards the end of his career, uh, restorative consultant at the time, he said he hadn't done an equilibration since 1984 and he thought it was pointless. Whereas I know other great clinicians whom I really respect who carry out equilibration a fair amount because they're doing bigger cases and they see it as a, a really vital uh, tool, a really vital step as part of their reconstruction. So which is the right answer? Uh, hopefully in today's episode, you'll get a bit more information about collaboration, which is actually really difficult to find. If you open your textbooks or if you search online, it's not much out there about collaboration, which is why I'm so excited to bring on an absolute superstar guest today. His name is Dr. Koray Faran, an absolute legend. I saw him lecture when I was just two months qualified and I, I'm pretty sure he's the guy that put me on the path towards really loving my dentistry and really uh, wanting to improve bit by bit. He taught me that the two pillars of restorative dentistry are illumination and magnification. Uh, and I will never forget that lecture that inspired me. And amazingly, uh, eight years later, here we are, I'm now interviewing my hero, Corey Ferran. I remember shadowing him actually, so I, so I went to that lecture, then I shadowed him in his uh, clinic, I think it's near, it's near Harley Street, it's Wimpole Street. It was the first time I'd been somewhere where there were two nurses working for one dentist. So I'd heard of four-handed dentistry, but I had just seen for the first time uh, six-handed dentistry and this beautiful screen in front of me where he was showing me the sinus lift as he was doing it. It was just a crazy experience for a recent grad. The protrusive dental pearl I have for you is a bit tongue in cheek in a way because I know we're talking about equilibration, which is essentially uh, the removal or the balancing of teeth via removal of tooth structure, right? That's equilibration. But the, the protrusive dental pearl I'm giving you is a communication one and it is this. It's something that Ed McLaren taught me at the Tubules Congress uh, as he was lecturing. When you have a patient who has a crowding and you want to uh, convince them to have some orthodontics because you think that by prepping for veneers, you would be too aggressive and you're in root canal territory, which you never want to be. You know, you never want to be in dentine for your veneers. So to get the point across, a really good communication tip that Ed McLaren shared was, you tell the patient, um, you don't say, oh, I have to remove uh, the, this part of the tooth. You say, um, I don't want to have to remove your healthy body parts to be able to achieve this goal. I don't want to remove these healthy body parts. What a, what a great way to communicate that. So I just wanted to pass that on to you and it's really tongue in cheek in this episode because you're thinking, okay, Jazz, you're being really cheeky here because we're talking about equilibration. But actually the other way to think about equilibration, so it just ties in nicely, is that uh, there are some dentists who think that, oh, um, I'm not going to do equilibration because I don't believe in equilibration, but I will prepare the 28 crowns. Uh, what's going to be less invasive? An equilibration to get some balance or to get the correct bite, quote unquote, uh, or 28 crown preps. So just think about where uh, an equilibration come in. And sometimes equilibration is 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 like partial equilibration so you're doing partly additive on one side maybe and you're equilibrating just a little bit so that overall you're having to place less restorations but you know this is everything that we're going to talk about with Corey Fran in terms of uh, the workflow the protocols the whys the why not so I hope you enjoy this episode and yes we have Zach Kara again so you know it's going to be a fun one I'll catch you in the outro Corey Fran and Zach Kara, welcome back to Producer Dental Podcast. I hope you're both well. Uh, today we're talking about equilibration and, and I just wanted to do a little bit of introduction for you, Corey, before you take it away. Um, I've said this before on this podcast, maybe two or three times now, but when I was in DF1, it was 2013 November, I think, and you did a lecture. I still remember the title of it. It's called Excellence in Restorative Dentistry. And that two hour lecture you did was such a huge inspiring moment in my career that I just 
didn't know you could practice like that at all. Like coming from like a dense school and then early on DF1, that was a huge uh, needle mover for me. Uh, so uh, it's an absolute honor to have you on today. Uh, for those very few people, because you are you are global, my friend. You are global. Uh, you're well versed with the, the 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 Bard and also the European Aesthetic Societies. And uh, I, I know, I think you've done some um, work in uh, with Megagen and stuff like that as well. So that they're pretty international. So please tell us uh, about yourself for those listening all around the world. Okay, so um, I'm a general dental practitioner. Um, I haven't got a specialty. I did a perio MSc, but I've been restorative and implants and um, everything related. For, for, for me, generalism is a specialty uh, because I think the kind of patients that I have seen over the years don't come in neat packages. They come with a whole host of problems. And unless you know how to put all them together and diagnose them and put them all, you know, the treatment together, you come a cropper. And the thing I've learned is, as I've been a GDP all, you know, all this time, um, I might be known for implants, but I'm actually probably getting more better known for treatment planning. We're doing something big with tubules as well, um, with, with regards to treatment planning and consent and, and communication. Um, but for me, um, today's topic is an integral part of dentistry, and I think it's not very well taught. Um, and it's really not something I was into or understood in the first decade of my of my practicing career either. So I, I'm now principal of a four surgery practice in the West End. Um, I've been in the West End for close to 20 years. And you kind of gradually make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone misses stuff. And my practicing protocol has basically been a case of a, a, the rule of incremental improvement is every time you do something wrong, you learn from it. And you make sure you incorporate it into your next bit of protocol, which makes me really anal, <laughs> and it makes me really um, surely it, not. It's difficult. Not you, Cora. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit OCD, but it but it means the pe the people who who come to it fresh sometimes find it overwhelming. Um, you, you know, Shiraz Khan has joined me a, a, a year and a bit ago. And when he sort of first arrived, he sort of said, I get this, I get this, I get this, but this is new. And he's <laughs> sort of gradually sort of come to me and says, like, okay, what do I do here then? And it's like, well, you know, you've done all the right things, then all you've got to do is this. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. Boom. Okay. So as you learn gradually, as you as you make the mistakes, which are often expensive, not just financially, but reputationally and relationship wise mm -hmm. with patients, you learn to work in a certain way where you don't leave any holes in the safety net. And that's kind of probably what I'm known for more than anything. I don't cut corners. I can definitely vouch for that after having sh shadowed you uh, and seeing you do a sinus lift at a time. I was very new to qualified dentist. So, I mean, um, if had I been an implant based dentist, done some sinus lifts, I, what you were doing was gold, I'm sure. But for me, just being in your presence and the way you communicated and just your um, the way you uh, worked, six-handed dentistry, that was something cool to see. I've never seen that before. So that was that was amazing. Uh, Zach, welcome back to the podcast, my friend. Always a welcome guest. Uh, <laughs> tell us, Zach, the, the, before we actually pick uh, Corey's brain, have you had much experience with this dark art of equilibration, Zach? So um, some of my backstory, my uh, historic stuff in dentistry comes from the Pank Institute in Miami and Florida. And um, actually, you know, along those lines, I've got a real interesting question for you, Corey, and both of you, actually, because both of you are proper occlusion nerds, right? Corey said something really, really interesting. And I've shadowed Corey as well. Um, by the way, this isn't some sort of plug for just keep knocking on Corey's job. I'm sure he doesn't just want to be watched every day. I've got 300 emails about to land in your inbox going, can I come too? <laughs> okay. However, just to say, um, you hit nail on head with something a second ago. You said that generalist, being a generalist is a specialty of its own. I think that's beautiful. Why is it then that both of you have drawn yourselves to occlusion? Why does that seem to be some sort of key to becoming a generalist who really gets it, a comprehensive thinking generalist? Why does that matter so much? Well, for me, it's a little bit like if you're going to build a block of flats, you just got to make sure the ground is level, right? So equilibration and occlusion isn't, isn't a dark art. It's a set of very simple, basic diagnostic steps that if you get right, will mean that your dentistry is much simpler and much more predictable. And if you get wrong, can be a nightmare. So all it is, is it's just checking that, you know, a lot of dentists think about teeth, but really what you need to think about is 
the dynamics of how those teeth relate to each other statically and in and in function. And that to me is occlusion, but it's a combination not only of tooth positions and tooth contacts, but it's also about where your temporomandibular joint is, where your discs are, how stable it is, how the muscles are acting on them, how the patient is adapting to those relationships. So it's it's actually just a, a chain of looking for, for the right things. And once you see them, and once you understand what those signs and symptoms mean, you start your restorative dentistry in a much safer position. So essentially, it's just leveling the playing field before you start building. That's all it is. It's nothing. It's not a dark art. It's just good, good anatomy, good physiology, good dentistry. But, but great. The reason I call it a dark art at the beginning collaboration is um, twofold. Okay, one is a lecture I attended by Professor Richard uh, Ibbotson, I believe his name is, at the BDA, and he. He literally poo-pooed it. He said, I haven't done an equilibration since 1984. And he was like, this is some mumbo jumbo stuff. And it's really uh, teeth fiddlers need to, to stop. That was his sort of thing. And then in my uh, hospital years in restorative, both at Guy's and at Sheffield, and I'm happy to be challenged on this, but I'm pretty sure very few of those many consultants, like 20 plus consultants, had ever even done an equilibration. So why uh, there's something about the UK and UK trained dentistry and and certainly the, the the restorative consultants who are friends of mine dear friends of mine they don't practice collaboration have never done it so they obviously somehow work work their way around it or whatever but maybe we're, we're they're approaching it just in a completely different way so let's go back to the the, the very beginnings um, what how do you define as an equilibration and let's just go from there and then we'll get Zach's input of what what Panky perhaps taught him okay so my first thing is the t the tooth fiddler reference. Yeah, you shouldn't be tooth fiddling, okay? Equilibration is <laughs> should be something done quite precisely. Equil okay, for my first golden rule, equilibration should not be done in somebody that has an unstable temporomandibular joint relationship. If you have TMJ disease, you diagnose what that disease is, you diagnose it clinically. If necessary, I mean, you, if necessary, you take an MRI. If there's, a, if there's a disc issue, if there's a disc displacement, if there is protracted muscular problems, you have to resolve that first. And that's that's the, the, the other dark art of, of deprogramming, of, of using splints and stents. And when do you use what what design of stent and splint? You know, oh, I only use anterior deprogrammers. Well, okay, you're probably not doing your the patients the best service then. I only use this, I only use that. No, if you, you make a diagnosis as where your TMJs are, what your discs are doing, if you're not sure, then MRI them. I think we're underutilizing MRI. Um, we had a very interesting chap called Kevin Lotsoff um, lecturing with us on our recent TMJ course. Um, he's probably the, 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 the preeminent guy who understands not only how to take a proper open and closed TMJ MRI, but how to decipher what's going on. And he's actually saying, guys, you're underutilizing. I see stuff every day that you guys are missing and you are building your dentistry on unstable foundations. So the first thing is, are the TMJs functioning correctly? Are your discs in a reproducible or stable position? And is the neuromusculature that controls your joint movements and your and your jaw movements healthy? If it is, okay, then you diagnose where your occlusal problems are, and then you decide whether you need to equilibrate or whether the patient is already adapting. Now, is is a, is a, an occlusal premature contact? Does it have to be equilibrated, or has the patient adapted? If you don't diagnose it, then you don't know what you're treating. And you find that out when you start the treatment dentally and you suddenly find that your jaw relationships change or the patient can't tolerate what you've put in or things start breaking for no apparent reason. And when you've lived it, you understand. So then you have to trace your way back and say, well, why is this happening? So for me, equilibration is a tool to level your your, your ground before you start. But ha the TMJ diagnosis must come first. You don't equilibrate until you've made a TMJ diagnosis and a functional diagnosis. Can you elaborate a little further on the assessment side of things? But specifically, you said neuromusculature. This is something that's, that sounds very specific. But actually, in reality, you hear about different um, methods of diagnosis, including all sorts of things, including uh, you, need to get a, you need to get your stethoscope out. You need to get all sorts of stuff that's going to help you um, in different ways. And I think that, that, well, that becomes, that becomes um, one of the barriers to entry 
to this seemingly dark art, which is not that dark an art, actually, because you're absolutely... Would you agree with that, Corey? You made a face there as if to go, not I think, sure. I think the stethoscope might be overkill, though I can understand why people might say, okay, use a stethoscope. But, you know, the best stethoscope we've got really is just the pads of our fingers. And if you actually just get a patient to open and close and jiggle their jaw out, you can see exactly what that jaw, joint head is doing or not doing. Sometimes it, it moves cleanly and it moves back. There's no noise. Sometimes one side moves, the other side doesn't. Sometimes it rotates, but it doesn't move. Sometimes it locks. Sometimes it opens, but it can't close. All of those are diagnostic, and there are five stages generally of TMJ disease from healthy, mild problem, more advanced problem, more advanced problem, and joint totally buggered. Um, and the question is, well, Don't write that in your notes. Yes, you know, <laughs> JTB, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, as a, as a point, in fact, I've just got a patient at the moment who literally I've just um, had an MRI before he came back. We've diagnosed she's got avascular necrosis of the of the entire condyle. There's no blood supply to it. It's just black. You look on an MRI, it's it's gone. It's not there. And, you know, and yet if you don't take an MRI, you won't you, you won't see this. Her disc is in a relatively normal position. So the, what I'm trying to say is that that is in its in a start diagnosing where the disc is and what the likely cause of that is. Now, it could be an injury. It could be it could be occlusally related. It could be accompanied by muscular dysfunction. So the mandible can't open very wide. It can't go to one side very wide. It, patient gets pain. There's a whole, you know, I mean, we run a whole two day occlusion course and there's a whole list of things that you look for. Um, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not hundreds of things, but there's, you know, five to 10 things that you really need to have a look at. And then when you put all those together, and if, you know, if this is positive, if this is positive, if this is negative, if this is negative, then you come to a diagnosis. And then from that diagnosis, you say, well, is the cause occlusal? You know, is the patient, has the patient got muscular symptoms and difficulty opening and pain because they've got a premature contact somewhere? Well, how do you find that out? You put in a deprogrammer. You get rid of the contact if the pain goes, and then when you take the deprogrammer out, the pain comes back. It's a pretty good chance that it's going to be occlusal, but you then still have to make sure that the TMJs are healthy and the muscular spasm is gone, and the jaw could be put into a centric relation and the disc is in the right place before you decide what to equilibrate and if an equilibration is required. And and it's all step by step. There's no there's no magic to it. It's just, have I got the information? And this is like anything. If you, if every single one of us had exactly the same information from a patient, in other words, in ad if adequate time is spent looking, recording and diagnosing and thinking, we should all come up with the same diagnosis. We may all have different treatment plans, but the diagnosis should be mm -hmm. the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. If 10 dentists don't come up with the same diagnosis, then either there is inadequate information or there is inadequate knowledge. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for me, if like if I know what's going on with the TMJs and it looks like there's a tooth involved that's a problem, or a patient comes in with me and says, Look, my front tooth keeps falling out. Can you make a can you make a stronger post? And the dentist goes, Yeah, of course I can. I can drill a bigger hole, I can put a bigger post in, and what happens is that falls out too. Or the tooth starts drifting, or the root fractures. It's not got nothing to do with the post. It's got to do with how the occlusion is. So unless you diagnose all of these and see all of these, you're going to end up doing not doing the patient the best service. So the deliberation is just one bit of the pie. It's it's a tool. It's not a it's not a um, it's not a magical process. It's 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 to resolve a situation that you've diagnosed. It's to resolve a problem. 8th of November 2021. Save that date in your diary right now, Patrice Rati, because I am reopening the doors to Splint Course. Splint Course Online is my flagship program uh, all about clues appliances and the management of TMD. So if right now, if 2021, if wherever you are right now is the best time for you to expand your knowledge and skills, to not be confused by TMD anymore, to be able to take a brilliant history and have a sound understanding of anatomy so you can help so many more of your patients, even just protect your patients from the pathological effects of bruxism or to help your patients in pain. If this is the year right now, then come and join us. We've got dentists from all over the world joining us from USA and Canada to all the way to Australia and everywhere in between, including Estonia. So if you need that help to identify which are the red flag patients when it comes to TMD that you shouldn't touch as a general dentist or even some specialists who've done my program and uh, knowing when to refer and, and which is the low hanging fruit, which is the, the cases that a lot of dentists get worried or scared about, but actually, with the 
correct diagnosis, correct explanation, and sometimes the correct appliance, you can really, really help these patients. The course aims to make you fantastic at giving conservative care. So before we get into the realms of invasive procedures and surgeries, all dentists should be able to deliver cracking conservative care and splints can be part of them. Now the splints we cover is everything from NTI, Michigan's, Tanner's, B splints, uh, dual arches, single arch, uh, even how to give a soft splint properly, which many of us actually don't know. The course is 100% online, so you can access it from anywhere in the world, but you also have 12 months of online coaching, so we can go over your cases as well as the secret Facebook group and a bazillion different handouts, including the course ebook. The feedback I've had from delegates has been absolutely mind-blowing. Just listen to these three. The way you have taught us how to examine the muscle of mastication, there for the hypertrophy, how to do the load test, how to see those, uh, you know, signs and symptoms. I think that is itself is a cause. I think patients like it. I think they feel like you're looking at stuff that's not been looked at before and you're taking it seriously. I think it's mostly just getting the confidence to know that this is the right sort of treatment for that situation. And um, so yeah, really good. I'm using my leaf gauge several times a day. I think the support has been fantastic. You can message Jazz whenever you want. We've got the the modules where you can go back and revisit. Then I just think it's really well put together. I don't, I don't think you can improve it. If you like the sound of that, then head to splintcourse.com and register for your interest. And let's catch the main episode now. I can imagine so many people driving their car right now or, or chopping their onions or doing their gardening or whatever they, they're doing, listening to this, thinking, oh, that'll be why the front... Do you know, there's, there comes a point in everyone's career, doesn't there, where you know that, that, that tipping point between I didn't know what I didn't know and, oh my goodness, that must be why. Because a lot of times in dentistry, particularly as an undergrad, you're taught restoratively and you're taught procedures, procedures aren't you? And you, you, you're taught that if you miss that particularly important step in the bonding of this very technique sensitive uh, system, if you get that wrong, then you, you must have done something wrong. But actually, we don't think about the bigger picture enough, do you? Until you become more comprehensively minded, and usually through failure of your own, you stop looking single tooth and you start looking multi tooth in a segment or in an arch or in a quadrant. But then you start looking whole mouth and go, crap, I've got to look around the mouth now. I've got to look at the jaw joint mm -hmm. and the ligaments and I've got to look at my human in front of me. How about the shape of their face? Give, just give them a bit of chewing mm -hmm. gum to chew and sit in front of them and see what their jaw does. You know, people say, Smart. oh, how should I restore this upper premolar where the palatal cusp was fractured off? Oh, it should be done in gold. Oh, no, it should be done in amalgam. Oh, no, it should be done in composite. No, what should be done is you look at the contralateral canine first to see if the guidance has worn away. And that's why that tooth is, has, got, has, got a, you know, has got an interference in the occlusion. That's why it fractured. You know, if the guidance isn't correct, then whatever material you put in there is going to break or wear. Yep. And then you go, okay, so why would you restore the, the, the canine at that particular angle? Well, you need to look at the contralateral condylar angle. Condylar angle. <laughs> right. right. So, Genius, right? Isn't this thing brilliant when you think about the whole picture? When you, when you, when you put it all together, it's really not that difficult. It's, I mean, it's like you, mm -hmm. you, die, you, 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 do, you take a bite wing and you see caries and you put a probe in it and it's soft and it's brown and there you go, it's caries. Um, you know, you stick a probe into a pocket and it's nine millimeters and pus comes out. That's perio disease. It's the same thing with occlusion. If you don't look for the signs, you're not going to see, you're not going to diagnose the disease. And occlusal diagnosis is just as important as caries and periodontal disease. With you mentioning that equilibration is a tool, what are the, what is the end goal? So let's talk about what a few example scenarios where you think, okay, here's my diagnosis. Therefore, as part of their management, one step of their process will be equilibration. Now, what is it that you're trying to achieve with that equilibration? And what alternatives could there be um, or adjunctive th therapies that you could have as part of the equilibration? Perfect. Good. All right. Great question. So the first question is, what are we actually trying to achieve? What we're trying to achieve is comfort and health and stability, all right? You can have patients with all sorts of malocclusions. Okay, I have a clicky jaw, but I've had a clicky jaw for 30 years and my, my dentition isn't deteriorating. I'm not fracturing bits off. I'm not in pain and I can function. Do I need to be equilibrated? I have, non, I have premature contacts and a slide on my premolars. I don't because they're not in the way of my function, all right? So I have occlusal disease but it's not destructive occlusal disease. I have to diagnose it, I have to show the patient, and I have to then say to them, it probably doesn't need treating, as long as you know about it. But if somebody comes into me and says, look, you know, 
I had a root filled tooth up here that broke and then I've got another root filled down here that's broken as well. And now my front tooth here is broken. And, and ever since that broke, my, my right left joint's been really painful. I've got, you know, I have a patient who has occlusal disease, just the same way as a patient who has periodontal disease or caries. That person has not got a stable occlusion. So the ultimate aim of any occlusal diagnosis and procedure or restorative work is to ensure that the temporomandibular joints sit in a stable position where they're not doing damage to the discs, where the discs are in a in a, in a stable position on the condyles. You want the, the, the condyle to be um, on the disc, not on one edge of it, not off it. You want it on the disc, you want it to move with the disc, and you want the muscles around the joint to all move harmoniously without giving pain and allowing full functional movement. That's the uh, and that's the end result. Now if what is preventing that is a dental contact, then equilibration is to eliminate that dental contact in a controlled fashion. So you do it on models first with the patient articulated in centric relation, and you look at what happens if you adjust that contact. If you adjust that contact, then another contact is going to need adjusting, and then another, and then another, and then another. And equilibration is seeing which contacts, which tooth contacts need to be adjusted to allow the condyles to fully seat and for the occlusion to be then fully stable without interferences in any dynamic position. Now, to be able to do that, you have to get the patient into centric relation reproducibly. If you can't do that, you have to use a deprogrammer first. The deprogrammer will have two effects. It will relax the musculature and allow mandibular repositioning, but it will also diagnose whether the problem is occlusal. It could be traumatic. Somebody might have fallen off their bike. Somebody might have got into a fight. Mm -hmm. Some people you know, might have just had their jaw held open too long when they're having the wisdom teeth out. If it's traumatic, it has a different diagnosis. It's a traumatic temporary mandibular joint disorder. But if it's occlusal, the equilibration is to eliminate the problem that is causing the dysfunction. That's all that is. Can we like one of Jazzy's favorite catchphrases at the moment, by the way, is can we make this a little more tangible? Can we make this tangible, Corey? I just want to slow this down for some people who might be listening to this. And I love how fluently, by the way, that you talk about this. This is obviously in your heart and soul. It's like part of you, isn't it? And I love listening to you. I love, yeah, you can just tell, right, can't you? And you can tell the passion that Corey has about his subjects, which is brilliant. The thing that I found in my first two or three years out of university is that I didn't, because I hadn't had enough experience of seeing enough hundreds and thousands of mouths yet, I hadn't been there and done that and seen the negative end results of if you don't catch these things early enough. So can we make it a little more tangible? What happens if, let's say, we've got a premature contact on a tipped lower premolar, which is non-axially loaded, and... You can see other signs of tooth surface loss elsewhere, and you can see that this person uh, potentially has a heavy set mandible, let's say, big, strong mass to muscles and all the rest of it. What are you thinking? Okay, first of all, before we do, I mean, when a patient comes in for a consultation with me, you know, they they fill out a whole load of paperwork, which, you know, is very onerous, and they, you know, they fill out the medical history. It's very and onerous, by the way. It's huge. On purpose. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> But isn't that also just a subtle thing, by the way, isn't that also on purpose because you're trying to select an audience for a reason? I want somebody to realize that we're asking questions for a reason. Yeah. So they come in and we sit for the first 10, 15 minutes, just get to know them. What can we do for you? Why are you here? How did you get here? You know, what do you hope for us to achieve? Da, da, da. The first thing I do clinically, I obviously sit, I sit them up and I look at them whole symmetrically. The first thing I do is I stand behind them and palpate everything. And I put my fingers on their TMJ and I say, can you open as wide as you can for me? And I look to see what the mandible and the condyles do. And you can shut your eyes and do it because you can feel the way the condyles move or don't move. You can see which way the mandible deviates. You can see if one side moves better or worse than the other. Now, the next thing I do before the patient gets tired, I lie them fully back. So I tell them, I'm going to lie you almost till your head down. I lie them fully back. I extend, I adjust the headrest so that I can extend their neck right back making sure they don't have any ankylosing spondylitis or neck problems that prevent this, obviously, in the medical history. Mm -hmm. But as long as I just tell them, are you okay lying back? Are you okay lying flat? And tell them, I'm going to extend your head as much as possible. I then get them to almost just kind of look, you know, try to almost arch their neck. And I ask them to get to open a little, just a little. I then get them to roll the tip of their tongue mm -hmm. to the back of the roof of their mouth. And I get them to slowly close. And I say, where do you first hit, left or right? 
and they say right or left, they point. So I then get a piece of articulating paper in Miller's forceps, dry the teeth, and get them to repeat it, just tap, tap, tap it. And the first photograph of the patient we take is that single point of contact where they hit. That is their centric relation contact position, or whatever you want to call it. Centric, That's my preferred term as well, CRCP. Like yeah. centric relation. So it's the first contact point in the centric relation. In other words, their, their, their mandible regiment. Now, here is where the first point of diagnosis is. Can they actually get into centric relation? If you ask them to tip their head mm. back and roll their tongue back and their mandible is out here and they can't get back, I already know I have a, a muscular mm. problem. That person, the first thing I'm thinking is this person's going to need some deprogramming. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, but if they can get into centric relation and I have the same dot on two separate attempts, that's my CRCP. I record it photographically on every patient. At the same time, what I record is in that point of contact, I record the incisal relationship, and then I ask them to clench together until they're fully in intercuspation, so centric occlusion or maximum intercuspation or ICP or mm -hmm. home position or whatever you can call it, and I then see what the mandible does and where it slips to. So I have two photographs, one with them slightly open and one with them closed, and that's the difference between your CRCP and your CO. Can I just say, if you're listening to this, rewind, 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 and listen to the last five minutes 20 times. Go and listen to it 20 times. That is gold. That slide is going to, if you don't diagnose it, is going to be the bane of your life if you're doing something extensive on that patient. Yeah. And I just want to put the context for those listening, correct, is uh, they have to understand that you are treating patients who are, are often being referred to you or self-referred and you know they're not coming in for their den plan check with you right they're coming for a thorough uh, a, a assessment um it can be done quickly but this the, you know the, i want people to understand that what you're doing is i know you're not a specialist but what you do is very specialist in nature and you're treating uh, full mouths very comprehensively and that is the cornerstone the very foundation of it so a, a young dentist who's a few years out um the 10 minute checkups um yes it might not be part of your protocol but you need to know when it should be part of protocol, if you're doing anything more ambitious, uh, full mouth, and that's the kind of time you definitely want to be checking, because just like you said, Jazz, I'm going to counterbalance that. Not always. Not yeah, always. Yeah, you, yeah, no, I'm not saying not always. I'm saying if you're doing big full mouth dentistry, then you, I think that's where no, you begin, always. right? So I think I that, that's what think, Jazz, I think, this, I think this is something I, I would actually slightly disagree with. I think you need to do it on every patient. Mm -hmm. uh, you should, but that, 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 the dentist, 10 minutes examination, they've got their BPE, the, the jacket's got to be taken off by Mrs. Smith by the time she walks and sit down. I'm just trying to make it real world for, for the majority of clinicians. Then you come to the other bit of the philosophy. Why is your consultation yeah. 10 minutes? Oh, 100%. No, no, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm with you there the whole way. Everyone deserves a comprehensive exam. I, I, I'm totally with you in that. Here's the issue. If I take a photograph of a patient who's got an MOD restoration and an upper four, and that first point of contact is on the palatal cusp, and I don't see it, I don't record it, and I don't tell them, and three weeks later they come in with that cusp fractured, whose fault is it? Mm -hmm. Mm, absolutely well you can wriggle yeah. your way out of it in several ways it was probably it was probably the, <laughs> bro, it was probably the olive stone everyone it was a soft a, bread it was it a was soft, soft bread, bread <laughs> cheese sandwich always the soft bread <laughs> no it, it came off with the soft bread it, came, it, it, it it broke while you were grinding on it you're absolutely right so, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. don't diagnose that to me that's as big a miss as missing caries into the pulp it's a diagnosis of occlusal disease, and instead of seeing as occlusion as a peripheral thing, we have to see occlusion as a fundamental part of the examination. Now, mm -hmm. if you if you spot it and you tell the patient, you say, "Look, really, what we need to do is is get some occlusal records, see what would happen if we equilibrated you, and then once you've equilibrated, you take the load off that cusp. You may prevent a fracture just by doing." And invariably what happens is patients who aren't even aware that they've got an occlusal interference, once you go through the, 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 the procedure, which is completely non-invasive, by the way, you, you take records, you take central relation records, you put them on an articulator, you do it on the articulator first, you show them what the adjustment requires, they then consent or not, okay? Mm -hmm. They consent to it and you adjust them, they will almost 99.9% .9 of the time say, Blimey, that feels so much more comfortable. They didn't know they were uncomfortable. All right? Now, I'm not mm -hmm. saying every patient needs equilibration, but if you see a premature contact, 
causing damage, crack lines, history of a fractured cusp, TMJ, muscular problems, displacement of the joint when they're occluding, you have to tell them. If you don't spot it, it's a missed or a maldiagnosis or a misdiagnosis. I like that example. I like that example you gave because I think that makes it really tangible with the, pre- the premolar. So that was a fantastic example, I think. Uh, Zach, you were, you, you, you were challenging me, Zach. I said, uh, I said for that busy guy with 10 minute checkup that he can't be, he or she can't be doing it. And I, I pre- and I, you know, in the real world, the, the bigger problem is why are they doing 10 minute checkups? And I, I completely appreciate well, that. We've, we've covered this previously, right? We, it's all about designing your own life. If, you, if you're in a scenario where you're listening to a podcast of this type of nature, well, actually, you're clearly interested in something along, along the lines of advancing your career or learning more about what's out there mm. in, in your working world. You're not just sitting listening to the same you know, nonsense at lunchtime with you around, some, around the normal people you do. Let's rewind a little bit. You say your 10-minute checkup. Mm. This shouldn't be spotted at a checkup. This should be spotted at initial consultation. Comprehensive exam. Uh, oh, no, this is, this is so true. And so what you plant in the, as the seeds of thought in the minds of our patient base becomes your working world, becomes your own destiny. What you've then done is you've designed yourself a future where you're going to have a diary filled with emergencies. Now, all right, can I just put, put something to you? I'm sure during complicated rehabilitations and work that you do, full mouth comprehensive dentistry, once in a while, something will happen. Uh, something will debond. Something as a temporary that was intended to come off at some point will come off and yeah. it needs to be reseated. Yeah. But how often is it that you have somebody who has, let's say, completed their all encompassing course of treatment whose mouths fail? Luckily, it's rare. I couldn't afford it to fail regularly but we do get them we do get enamel you know we do get chips we get porcelain chips just like everybody else it's just you, you reconstruct somebody top and bottom in ceramic you get it i'm not saying we don't do you have a diary space every day allocated for one two three no. people's bust, teeth bust no, absolutely not you don't need it right I need it. and so if you're listening to this thinking oh no that's normal to me i always have something squeezed in that something happened where something happened well Ask yourself why you've Get got the a GIC working out. world like this. Yeah, well, it's, it's classic, isn't it? But it's self-perpetuating as a problem, Jazz, isn't it? Because as soon as you start slapping Fuji 9 on everything, then everything becomes a Fuji 9, and then you do single-tooth dentistry. No the, wonder the nurse this has is got good. it ready. With every emergency, like the trays have been set up for it, right? And, and see, so the, I, I've joined a practice now where the dentist poor, bless his heart, he's, he's, he's just retired, uh, amazing dentist, great at diagnosing caries, great at diagnosing perio, but not having those discussion about where mobility, fremitus, crack lines, so missing the whole occlusal disease element. And now I'm coming in, I'm having those. So I, you know, this practice went from doing uh, zero deprogrammers to like several uh, factors of them and having those big amount of discussions and now uh, converting these cases to more comprehensive dentistry. But it's exactly, we have these emergency spaces in every day and the most common emergency we get is a broken tooth, a, uh, a cusp fracture, uh, and it goes back to what, what, what Corey says. You need to examine that at the initial consult, not at a 10 examination. But Zach, when I did suggest that, hey, if you are that dentist who um, has to pick and choose who you can and can't, unfortunately, uh, give a comprehensive exam to, and you're going to be now treating someone like a young dentist, typically their foray into uh, or their entrance into treating bigger cases would be a dull technique, okay? Whether you love it or hate it, I truly believe that the, the young dentist in the UK Okay, when they're starting to think bigger, they're taught the dial technique. That's the thing that the all uh, undergrads are taught, uh, and that's what they might do. Now, even that case, you still need to check your central relation contact point. But, but Zach, you were just saying perhaps that's not necessary, right? Well, no, no. I, I was. Um, I, you were making the point that um, your CRCP isn't always possible within a ten-minute checkup. So uh, when, when we said um, that CRCP can be identified for everybody. Um, I completely agree that, that that is actually a cornerstone of identifying the things that can go wrong. And it's usually, for me, a start point in a conversation about how things can progress inside people's mouths. See, one of the problems with every single unique individual, individual that you look after is they don't have the benefit of the all-encompassing nature of the general public's mouths that we've seen. They haven't seen the way that mouths progress over the course of people's lives. They yeah. haven't seen the 20 year, 30 year, 40 year saga that in, uh, unfolds bef- before us. Now, you don't have to be, and by the way, it's encouraged definitely that, that you stick around in one practice for several years because seeing your failures and seeing the way things go wrong is ultimately the best learning method, right? But you can see people in your patient base, even within a year period, let's say, who are in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, put your Sherlock Holmes hat on. And ask yourself, 
Let's be a detective today. Why did that person in their 60s end up that way? Now, let's find somebody in their 20s who might be going that way. And let's see if we can identify that obvious pattern spotting. And dentistry for me is quite a lot of pattern spotting. You spot these things all day, every day, don't you? There aren't that many variables in the head and neck and mouth. There's quite a few, but there's not as many in the whole body as, as in the whole body. All you've got to be doing is looking and using your eyes. And one of the best things that you taught me, me Corey, is that you need screens. So I have so many screens in my office now. I was like, I <laughs> it kind of took that overboard. Big screen. Um, <laughs> big screen. I mean, for me, I, I now have a 34 inch ultra wide and I have a 27 on top of it. And I'm like, I'm, that's about as far as I'll go. It's about as far as my missus will t- let me take it. But <laughs> the, the, um, the fact for me is if you see stuff because you've taken the time to take that photo, to step back, to look at the big picture and discover exactly what's happening you focus proper attention on people and i tell you it comes back to pay you dividends big that, time that was going to be my next point i said the person that you can't afford the time to spot this is the person that you're going to spend hours on sorting out later spend 15 minutes diagnosing it and save yourself 10 hours seriously that you know that you know the case i've just bought buster the lingual cusp off my lower seven. Oh, oh we'll just do an onlay for that mrs jones numb up come in do the prep, turn back, no space. <laughs> the space go. Come back to suddenly you have no you have no occlusal height left. Oh, and now there's an anterior open bite. What? What happened? What happened was you didn't diagnose a CRCP was on that seven. And as a result of that, instead of equilibrating everything first and then coming to restore the tooth, you then have already launched into restoring the tooth and then have to equilibrate everything in retrospect as an excuse. Or Corey, having that discussion with them that actually orthodontics might be needed here before you then do it and then suggest Correct. the orthodontics basically Correct. and then and it, yeah 100 uh, percent. when i learned that and i started to uh, use a leaf gauge to, to to sort of screen for these things and whatnot or whatever tool you want to use and your your way Corey, i haven't heard it that way before that's amazing uh, about their posture and you described it really well and how quick and easy you made it that that is so that's how you can do it in maybe 10 minutes but my my argument uh, zach was Busy clinicians who are based on single tooth dentistry, they will not see the value of it yet until this. It takes 60 seconds. It doesn't take 10 minutes. It takes 60 seconds. And also, um, I find that um, I'm not a big fan of manipulation. People say, I'm a good manipulator. People just push yeah. back. If, you can, mm. if you've got relaxed TMJs, you can get back yourself. Um, so to mm. me, letting the patient do it themselves just by posture and tongue rolling for me, is still the best way of seeing whether they can achieve CRCP. If you try and to for push- everybody else, you're basically saying every every other time that that's not possible or not reproducible, then there's a muscular issue and you're going to deprogram it. Correct. Correct. Basically, that's the flow chart. Correct. <clears throat> Jazz, the, um, the, the designing your own life thing really mm. comes into this comprehensive-minded dentistry, doesn't it? We've talked about it previously. And equilibrating, and maybe, you know, there may be aspects of some people listening to this thinking, equilibration is just drilling bits off teeth, isn't it? Well, you hit another nail on the head a second ago, which is that orthodontics can be a huge part of what we do. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. it's very possible to really just step back from the average single tooth dentistry mindset for a minute and listen, because this stuff is is more to it than I'm just going to tickle and fiddle about with a few teeth. And I've heard that that's a dark art. Now I won't bother with that. Can I ask a question? (laughs) Go on. How many orthodontists use articulators? Ha, 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 ha. The, the face group, two in the UK. <laughs> I'll tell you something. There are many orthodontists who think they do, but then when you ask them, do you know how, what happens if you can't reproduce that position? Or what happens if you've got a particular, let's say a brachyfacial type of patient, somebody with very strong masseters and somebody who's obviously going to resist um, uh, manipulation. Oh, well, just use a leaf gauge. Well, what happens if you push back onto retrodiscal tissue? Well, no, that'll be fine. And so people think they're doing things. Exactly. What happens next? So this is the thing. Until you become um, an all-encompassing, comprehensive-minded dentist, no matter if you're in one specialism or another, you're not really doing all of your patient base the best service, in my opinion. I mean, orthodontics has been called full mouth rehab with teeth. In an animal. So basically, if you're moving teeth around, you've got to make sure they mesh together. Yeah, teeth do settle in, if you like, but you need to have healthy TMJs for that to happen, and you need to have a decent relationship between your final arches. And yes, you will get micro-movements and things settling in and over-erupting a little bit and tilting a little bit. You know, 
you need a really good orthodontics for me is 80 20 it's, it takes 20 percent of the time to get 80 percent of the result but the real tweaking ha- occurs at the end and that's very very difficult and most orthodontists and most patients lose lose the patience at the end to carry on and get the tweaks right. For me, if ever I refer somebody to an orthodontist, I work with Moira Wong and with Asif Chatu, the patients know that at the end of their orthodontics, they're going to come back and have a full occlusal analysis and equilibration. That's part of it. Mm-hmm. The, the mm-hmm. orthodontics doesn't end when the, when the braces come off. So, well said. Well so said. for me, um, that's part and parcel. Now, they may need equilibration. They may not need good equilibration. The, the level of equilibration may be such that it's actually better to do additive. So this is where the diagnosis comes in. If you find that your equilibration, you know, chops everything off every tooth to get the mandible in the right position, then, then the correct solution is to raise the vertical dimension and add, not take away. So it's not chopping bits off teeth. It is, it is repositioning teeth, and it, it has to be made very clear to the patient that equilibration does involve the irreversible destruction of some enamel. And you say that you use the word destruction. I use destruction. I say, it, well, I say, cool. I'm going I'm to remove parts of the enamel of your teeth that, that won't okay. grow back. But mm-hmm. it's being done with a with a with a diagnosis, with a diagnosis and a therapeutic goal, and it's to prevent mm-hmm. bigger problems in the future. And basically, instead of instead of you instead of you spending years wearing the thing away and causing yourself TMJ problems. I'm going to do it for you in a way that allows you to settle. And this is how much I need to do. And one of the things I do when I equilibrate is I have the equilibrated models and I photograph every step of my equilibration. So it's literally, this is where the contact is. This is what I adjust. Photograph. Of course he does. He's cool right do you still that, write it? it in your notebook? You used to tell me like you used to write no, like this. I just have a sequence of photographs and I know where the dots are and I know where I've equilibrated. And every single dot in the mouth during an equilibration must have a corresponding um, contact on the models. If they diverge at any stage, I know the mandible has moved back and my initial record was not correct. Wow. So what you're suggesting is that when you're doing the equilibration, it actually, uh, it is the beauty of it. You're, what's happened on the articulator is more or less happening in, in the mouth, which is which is just the point of articulators, right? Which if is amazing. your centric relation is correct. If your centric relation mm. is out, you'll find out very quickly because what's in the mouth will not be what's on the articulator. And you'll know at that stage that your that your equilibration was incorrect. Now, even if the first point of contact was correct, it may be that there's a slight rotation. And and the, and the next point, the contact isn't the same in the mouth. If that's the case, then you deprogram them further. You then retake okay. the lower impression against the upper, um, lo- the record against the upper, rearticulate the low cast, repeat the process. You have to be honest with yourself. If you're good at what you do, if you if you get used to taking records and you see the reproducibility, it's really rare. I need to do that. It maybe happens once a year, but I see between 50 and 70 new patients a year roughly of those i would recommend i would probably reckon between a third and a half go through a full occlusal analysis and at least a partial uh, um, equilibration process it doesn't need to be much it might be one tooth it might be a couple of teeth um Mm -hmm. but invariably when you do it virtually all of them will immediately report that they're more comfortable. They didn't realize they were uncomfortable until they had it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. Right. Just to briefly add to that, is it also worth adding, what do you tell people the main benefit of this is? Or what's the risk of not doing this? Is it is it that you're straight to the point and you explain that root fractures and mobile teeth and those types of things may be possible? That's a very good question. Future outcomes? Yeah. So basically what I say to them is, this dot is the stone in your shoe. Okay, it's the thing that stops your your lower jaw from relating to your upper jaw the way your muscles want it to relate. So basically, it's it's something that's stopping your door closing properly. Now, you can push the door and it'll be fine. You've got no TMJ symptoms. You've got no crack lines in the teeth. You know, you've got no drifting, no history of breakages. And you've been like this for 20 years. You probably don't need it treated. But if you do find that things start to deteriorate, I'm going to recommend a full occlusal analysis. Would you like to go through a full occlusal analysis and, and see what would happen if we adjusted this? You know, the risk is you can get a spontaneous tooth fracture. Things can drift. Things can crack. Um, but, you know, I will say, actually, you're probably pretty low risk. Or I'll say, you know what, can you see that crack line? And can you see that that tooth has now started to wear? 
And the one that was behind it was the one that you broke two years ago and had a crown. And now that crown is out of occlusion and this tooth is taking the bruxage. <laughs> and then it's, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm, I've got one lady at the moment who's lost a tooth, keeps losing the crown on a lower six. Can I just make a bigger crown for her? No. Her centric <laughs> relation, when she closes her anterior open bite is five and a half mil. So it's like she has a major, a major discrepancy in every axis, anteroposterior, <laughs> transverse and vertical. She's basically pivoting around her sevens. And, you know, you, you speak with a maxillofacial surgeon. Well, actually, this needs to be a, a forward rotation, the four, not the four, a mandibular osteotomy. Um, and yet the patient says, I'm not having surgery on my jaw just for this. I just want to have this crown replaced. No, this is the diagnosis. And mm -hmm. I can replace your crown and you will break it or you will break the tooth. And then the next tooth and then the next tooth. But when they see it, they understand. It doesn't always mean that they will go ahead with what you're recommending, but they will understand why things are deteriorating. And then they'll start working with you as opposed to you having to give them an excuse as to why something's failed. That's key. That's absolutely key. I would love that door on hinge, door on hinge analogy in the stone or the, the something in the way, the snag in the way. Um, you might be able to tolerate it, but it might be giving you backache. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I specifically like the door on hinge analogy because as soon as you start saying, well, I can push the door closed and I can really force it, but what might be, I would probably at this point, if I was to sort of think through this in my mind, I would probably expect somebody to push back or I'd ask somebody, what would you expect to happen next? And they go, well, you know, there'd be a problem with the hinge, wouldn't there? Uh -huh. Correct. Okay. There is the hinge. Now, where's the hinge in the, in the mouth? There. And that's probably one of the most fragile and uh, potentially damaging outcomes of this type of con condition. Of the most used joint in the body. And the patients can relate to that very much. Uh, and when you make it relatable to their daily issues, their chewing and their function, it, 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 that's how to get the patient on board. So these analogies were, were brilliant, guys. I really appreciate it. Now, just want to... Uh, pick on the nitty gritty details. Uh, now we can't explore every single indication in a scenario. Um, and I would, you know, people ask me all the time, um, can you recommend an occlusion course? Um, at the end, please do tell us what, where you teach, Corey, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work and the, the amount of equilibrations you have done. I don't know anyone uh, in the UK who's done a, a, as, as many as that, basically. So uh, there's that's why I'm so excited to have you on today and, and, and you know, learn these little details and share. Um, in that case with that premolar, as we said, that premolar with the first contact, which may be at higher risk uh, at fracturing, if you take that patient, you've taken their scan or your models, you've taken a, a Facebook record, now correct me if I'm wrong here, Absolutely. and you've mounted it on you must. a, a semi-adjustable articulator. Yeah, you, just a, just a, just a, a semi-adjustable articulator. You don't need, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we do run a two-day occlusion course, which you can find at LCID Academy. Um, but mm -hmm. the thing is, you don't need, you don't need hugely advanced, you know, you don't need to look at lateral shifts and things like this. Yep, yep. It mm -hmm. just needs to be a, a centric relation position is a skeletal yep. position and it should be reproducible. It is reproducible if you get it mm -hmm. correctly. Um, and the, the key to this is to look at the anatomy, not of the lateral poles of the joint, no, not the outside bits of the mm -hmm. joint, but the inside, the, 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 the medial aspects, because that's actually where, uh, the, that's actually where the anatomy doesn't allow the condyle to move anywhere else. When you look from the side, you think, well, oh, you know, this condyle can be anywhere inside this socket. But actually, mm -hmm. when you look at the fact that it's a football and it's the medial aspect of your of your jaw joint, the, of, 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 the, of the actual um, socket that guides where your mandible is, you can see what centric relation really means. And if you can reproduce centric relation, your equilibration should be a doddle. And when, once you've done it, that becomes your backstop. The, the mandible is stable there. You can then go forward laterally. You can decide what your guidance is going to be. You can decide where the interferences are if you need to add to teeth or adjust teeth. So the, the equilibration is really just to get them into centric, centric occlusion in a, in a reproducible way. From there, you're then going to look at their protrusion. You're then going to look at their lateral excursions. Um, and you're going to look at their outside in and inside out function. So that's another thing, you know, we, we get people to bite on stuff and slide sideways. That's not how people chew. Remembering if you slide sideways, you're using, basically using medial pterygoid, which is a slightly weaker muscle. When you're closing and you're grinding from the outside in, you're using all of your major closing muscles, your temporalis and your masseter. So the outside in force you apply to an occlusal guidance uh, contact is higher than the one you use when you ask the patient to slide sideways. 
So always mm. also test them from the outside and get them to chew on articulating paper and see the marks. When, when you're actually assessing those marks on um, the models and then you're... I don't do those on the models. I actually do, I actually do the guidance in the mouth. Yes. Uh, but, but when you're actually doing the, the trial equilibration on the models... Yes. When, when you're doing the trial uh, and then you're going to take that to the mouth. Now, what are the fundamental um, rules of equilibration in the sense of uh, where to adjust? So for example, what you don't want to be doing is just hacking off cusps, making everything flat. So how can you do it in a safe way, uh, anatomically driven way? Slopes, not tips. Mm -hmm. Slopes, not tips. And which aspect of a slope you adjust will decide which direction a tip travels. OK, mm -hmm. so if you've got a cusp to cusp relationship and you don't want to know which way to go, well, basically what you do is you adjust one aspect of one cusp and the other aspect of the other. And you get the tips to move in relation to each other without losing height. So mm -hmm. slopes, not tips is, is the primary yep. one. And the second one is go for the bigger cusp rather than mm -hmm. the thinner cusp. OK, so don't th over thin a narrow cusp. Take a little bit more off the thicker cusp is the usual way it goes. Um, mm -hmm. But when you when you look at when you look in the mouth, you kind of gradually get a feel for where it, which aspect of the cusp is best to adjust. Depends where you mm -hmm. want to move the tip. You would ideally want your cusp to, to meet in fossy and not on marginal ridges and not edge to edge and not tip to tip. So as mm -hmm. you say, well, actually, you know, I've got this kind of relationship. You know, where do I adjust? Do I? I don't want to adjust the tip. I want to kind of adjust this aspect of this one and that aspect of the other, and then mm -hmm. the two mesh together. So it's a little bit of thought, but the general rule is adjust slopes, not tips. That's that's the main rule. I did an equilibration this morning, so uh, I, it's fresh in my head. Um, what do you do? And this is me still with the very in the beginning stages, and I'll tell you the the rationale of why I did an equilibration on my patient. I'll come to that in a moment. But the thing I remember the most, the biggest challenge I had was being confused or not confused, but being a bit like, whoa, all these red marks and then having to rub them away and then go again. So any hack you can give us. And obviously, like, if you've never done a collaboration before, go on a course. And I don't know many courses that teach collaboration. So I would recommend Corey's. At the time of the Dawson, I, I got taught by Dawson, uh, but I don't know. That in fact, none of the other uh, other occlusion courses I've been on actually teach collaboration. So definitely check out Corey's. But how can you help us to be more clinically efficient with the, the marks? Because otherwise, all you see is a, is a C of a uh, Black and, and red. Correct. So what I do is I actually get the laboratory to paint a very thin dye relief all over my occlusal surfaces and my incisal mm -hmm. edges. So it, it's my, the models come back with a red surface. I then use mm -hmm. an, a dark blue articulating paper and I hold it in my hand. I don't actually hold it in Miller's forceps. And what I do is I just I make sure the pin is up so that the pin isn't stopping the teeth from coming down. So the pin has to be up. And then what you do is you just close and just give a little tug. Close, just give a little tug. It'll either pull through or it, or it won't. Where it doesn't pull through should be a bullseye. Not, a, not mm -hmm. a streak, not a mark, but a bullseye. The bullseye indicates mm -hmm. that the cusp tip has gone through the paper and contacted. The bullseye is what you adjust, okay? And the bullseye on the model, the first one, should correspond with your CRCP that you took at your first consultation or after deprogramming, if you've had to deprogram first before you equilibrate. So the corresponding mark on the model should be exactly the same. Then you'll notice, so when you pull, if it pulls through, ignore the marks. If it doesn't pull through and it's a bullseye, that's your first one. And you should get to the point where eventually, as you equilibrate, the number of bullseyes gets more and more and more until... Every contact is a bullseye. Then you're fully equilibrated. Mm -hmm. Now, in the mouth, it's interesting. You end up actually doing more on the casts normally. But in the mouth, you get there a little bit quicker. You, you don't need to do all the fine control because there's a level of vertical movement, obviously, within the ligament of the tooth. Mm -hmm. so, so on the casts, you've got to account for the fact that they are totally immobile. And sometimes there's a couple of false positives, but it's actually a safe thing because, it, it, you know, you, you end up actually doing less in the mouth than you do um, on the on the cast. Also, once equilibrated, I think invariably you get a little bit of shift of mandibulars, a little bit more relaxation that you maybe didn't have with the deprogrammer. And I get them back in a couple of weeks later and I just fine tune them and make sure they're back. I was just going to ask about that. What's the protocol for afterwards? Mm. Um, provided all the dots correspond to what you've got on the models. 
and then you 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 just fine tune it and make sure. And invariably, and you must repolish things. Don't leave them rough. I do it with a with a red diamond, and then just go in with some brownies or some greenies and just just polish the enamel. Can we add a little bit more context for somebody who's maybe never seen, maybe even never, definitely never done one of these uh, equilibrations, but never even seen one of them happen? How do you guys make sure that that person is in CRCP every time that they close together? You, they have to be. They have to be in CR. Okay, so the same way where you do the equilibration with them lying back in the same position as you took the equilibration record, okay, and you've got to make sure that when they tap, 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 tap together, that you can feel that their mandible is doing this consistently, not mm -hmm. swinging around. Okay, mm -hmm. if they're still not do, if they're still not in the right position, then they're still not deprogrammed. You're prem you're premature. You have to keep deprogrammed. Now, with the, with a deprogrammer. What you find is if you make, let's say, a Michigan appliance, which is the most common one that I'd prefer to use, you'll find that when you first fit the deprogrammer, as soon as you fit it, their muscles do a bit of relaxation during that appointment. And the first thing that happens is that you fit the deprogrammer and you immediately find that your heavier contacts are towards the back of the, the, the deprogrammer. And you do a little bit of adjustment there. And then when you get them in for a review, you find that is still heavy on the back and you, you do a little bit more adjustment. And then gradually what happens is the deprogrammer, you do more adjustment at the back than you do at the front and then everything stops moving. Nothing else moves. It, it becomes stable. All the anteriors and the posteriors all hit at the same time. You fully deprogram. The muscles have relaxed. The condyles have moved back um, and they are now stable in their centric relation positions. There is no further movement backwards. And that then when you start getting even contacts on your on your deprogrammer with no more of the anteriors being lifted off slightly by the posteriors, then you know that you're fully seated. You know, that you're fully, from there, you can equilibrate. Have you seen an equilibration gone wrong, Corey? Have I seen an equilibration gone wrong? Uh, n no. Um, in, I'll tell you why. Because there are two things that can happen. The first thing that can happen is that your lower cast is not articulated properly. You're unlikely to get your face bear record majorly wrong. You know, there are only two ears, you know. <laughs> um, but you can but you can sometimes find that when you're taking the centric relation record, the patient postures slightly and you don't quite get. The, so what you then find is that what you do on the models is completely unrepresentative of what you see in the mouth. And you think, ah, this is wrong. So all I do there is I retake the records again, rearticulate the lower cast. All right. That's it's that simple. And then I come back. So that's the first thing. So you, the first one is an error of recording before you do anything. Yes, it costs time and money to do it again, but that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Once you once you do the equilibration on the models, you then look and see how much equilibration is required. Okay. Now, if you need an inordinate amount, don't start. The correct mm -hmm. procedure mm -hmm. for that is probably additive and to probably reconstruct an occlusion rather than adjust it away. Plus or minus ortho. Plus or minus ortho. Plus or minus yep. plus or minus um, orthognathic surgery sometimes. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. You've got a big transverse relationship, especially. But once you have seen on the, what you've got, a, you know, if you've got a, a reasonable amount of adjustment that you've done on the casts and it's totally reproducible in the mouth, right down to the last dot, then invariably the equilibration is successful. The patient is more comfortable. The occlusion is more stable. Um, you, you would, but that's just the first starting point. That, that is where you get the maximum amount of relationship stable. From there, you still have to check your protrusive and laterals and make sure that you've not got any non-working side or working side interferences. Then you have to play with your canine guidance and your incidal guidance. And um, if you, if you have got those and you've still got interferences, then you may need to orthodontically move teeth or you may need to adjust posterior cuspal slopes as well. That's mm -hmm. slightly more advanced as you get on. But th the main thing is to get that maxillomandibular relationship stable so that if you adjust any tooth, if you, t if you do a crown prep on a tooth, it's completely stable. What you, what you start off with is what you, what you end up with. So you don't have any mandibular movement in relation. If you don't diagnose it and you start and you start adjusting the tooth that is the first point of contact, it's like starting an equilibration and not knowing where it's going to go. Zach, this is your cue for am I naughty if? <laughs> this is my... And Zach does a am I naughty if? So am I naughty if? And sometimes it's not just him. It's just like he might be speaking the mind of a young dentist. Uh, am I naughty if I do this? So I'm Zach, not, do you want to start something? I'm not going to lie. I'm barren on am I naughty ifs for equilibration because um, do you know what? 
I think the the thing that most people will have with this is a complete blank. Do you think, mm-hmm. Jazz, that actually most people in dentistry in the UK will have kind of no real concept of this? Why does this not Absolutely. hit the radar of most dentists, Corey? I think it's just not given sufficient it's just not given sufficient coverage maybe in dental school i think it was not you, mentioned not the word equilibration in all our occlusion when you go back to richard ibbotson and said oh you know i've never equilibrated anybody okay i'm going to i'm going to qualify that it may be that he's treating full mouth rehab cases where he's doing all of his equilibration through restorative work Ah. Yes, yes. Now, he's mm-hmm. getting his centric relation, and then it's what is it, Eastman? Mm-hmm. Gold surfaces everywhere and gold palatals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he's done his equilibration by, by rehabilitation. Yeah. And you've equilibrated in temporaries at that point. But I'll bet my bottom dollar that he gets his centric relation record right. Okay? Mm. Yep, yep. But, but, but he can't say to me if somebody's got temporomandibular joint dysfunction and their muscles aren't working and they've got a, a, an immobile joint and they've got pain on the other side, and they can't open more than 25 millimeters, that you're going to restore that patient and they're going to be comfortable. There is no way that's going to happen. And anybody who says that that person doesn't need occlusal analysis and deprogramming and getting their mus- neuromusculature and the TMJs healthy before they go on to restore, for, for me, it's irresponsible. I don't believe them. I don't believe them. I don't think you can do it. If you, you won't get lucky once, but it won't happen consistently. Yeah. Absolutely. But I'm going to ask this, am I naughty if, because I just want, because I know the answer you're going to give. And I think a really important message to say safe is, am I naughty if I've got someone with um, occlusal trauma and some frematis and I start just making some marks and I start uh, drilling away to reduce the loads on these uh, teeth with occlusal trauma? Very naughty. Very naughty. What is the correct protocol? Because two, two reasons. First of all, you have no idea where it's going to end. Okay. And mm-hmm. you may find that somebody becomes much more uncomfortable if you if you remove them from there, if, if you remove that reference point that they're used to. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. suddenly they can't relate. And suddenly, yes, their muscles might relax, but then they have no occlusion because, you know, I used to meet here. Now, if you just occlu- adjust that and now if you just adjust that and then suddenly you're through the enamel, ouch, that hurts. Equilibration should never be, never go through the enamel, never OK, if the equilibration has to go through that enamel, you finally have to chop a large amount off a tooth. You should consider orthodontics or you should consider additive reconstruction to the whole occlusion. You shouldn't need to adjust three, four millimeters off a tooth. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you might need to be heavy. You know, you've got an over erupted upper seven that's hitting the distal of a lower seven. And you might need to adjust quite a bit off the anterior plane of that tooth because intruding orthodontically is, is very difficult. You know, you can't you can't easily intrude a single posterior molar. You can put, you know, tads palately and buckly and try to put elastics and things. But actually, it's not practical. So sometimes you mm-hmm. do need to adjust quite a lot. You just have to say to the patient, you know what, I actually need to remove four millimeters off this tooth and devitalize it and put a two millimeter crown on it to get your occlusion correct but if that's the diagnosis you come to it's inescapable you know mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. extract the tooth and implant it or you know if you want to eliminate the contact and that's what that's the only choice you have that's the diagnosis and actually if they've decided on balance that the the negative uh, potential consequence of not doing that outweighs the treatment itself then that's consensual that's an absolutely valid treatment so it's, uh, option. They can say, I don't want to have equilibration. I don't want to have this. I don't want you to do that. And then you say, okay, it's fine. But I think that like the hinge principle, if you've got, a, if you've got something in the way of the door and you keep trying to slam it, you're going to break something. It's like, then I would recommend that you perpetually wear a night guard. Then you make them a mm-hmm. proper Michigan appliance that allows them into centric relation that's been adjusted properly and say, and then get a couple of duplicates made. I mean, with, with CAD CAM now, you can just, you know, just get three of them made all identical. Milled. Um, mm-hmm. Milled or, you know, yeah. and then just say, I really would recommend that you wear this. And if you don't wear this, the chances are that you're going to do something like this. Now, 90% of the pa- patients may never fracture that upper four, but the ones that do, when they come back with it fractured, you say, I did say, and- mm. Then you can play, you know, smug you like. Um, and you know, I just, let, let, let's do what I recommended the first the, time, shall we? And then, that, that, that point becomes, 
it becomes their responsibility at that point yes. rather than your they're, excuse. They are fully entitled. And that's to really the really big deal. It's not yeah. your excuse at that point. It's their it's their responsibility. It is exactly um, that. And the, it is ex- it is entirely down to their level of consent. If they don't consent to you doing it, you can't do it. What you can't do is not diagnose it and then try to gloss it over when they come back and say, you know, why did my tooth break? You know, why did my tooth breaking teeth is quite difficult. Yeah. You need a lot of force. Mm-hmm. Oh, you've answered all my questions, Craig. Zach, did you have any uh, questions uh, about collaboration? I, I just want to uh, add, add one thing. I want to yeah. it has, isn't it? We were obviously enjoying ourselves like uber nerds on a Saturday night. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you, you said something uh, right at the beginning of this podcast, which I think is gold and very, very important. By the way, there were segments of this that I'm going to listen back to myself and go, do you know what? That just, you summarized that incredibly well there. Sometimes you just pick up those nuggets and gems where you go, I'm going to nick that. I say this a lot, don't I? That we add these mm-hmm. things to our patchwork quilts. And mm-hmm. you've no doubt, call I become a product of some of your mentors and some of the things you've learned over the years and some of your colleagues no doubt and um, you said something incremental improvement incremental improvement to me is a progressive movement in the right direction that's hope always um, for the progression of our careers but you it also made me echo um, I know a good friend of yours and uh, a mentor of mine too Basil Mizrahi it made me think of Basil's way of thinking about incremental improvements and incremental steps in the right direction of of our patient's treatment psyche and treatment acceptance and treatment outcomes. So Basil's approach, no doubt, and same with with yours, is that you always make small changes in the right direction in in order to achieve the end outcome. You cannot go from zero to hero. You have to take one step up the ladder, one step up the ladder, and so on. So what your equilibration might become part of it. Is there anything, would you echo that? And is there anything to add to that? I do. I mean, one of the things I lecture, lecture about is, is, um, is what I call stepping stone dentistry. So, you, you know, you've got to get from one bank to the other without falling in the water. <laughs> and, you know, every single one of these things we do is a stepping stone that makes the next step more predictable. Now, the interesting thing is that even after you've done all of this and you rehabilitate somebody, and you, you know, you, you, you put implants in and you bone graft and you do their perio and you do their endo and you you know, get their jaw relations correct, you provisionalize them, you provisionalize them again, you just the provisional, everything. <laughs> them, and then three years later, they come back, their jaw relationships have changed again. Things change. So then at your checkup, you must again look to see whether anything new has developed. Have I got a new premature contact? Have the teeth worn And my implant crown remained unworn so that my implant crown is now my CRCP. Why did my Mm -hmm. screw fracture? Why did my, why did my implant crown break? Why did it loosen? The chances are that your tooth contacts may have been fine five years ago. The patient hasn't been back for five years because they've been fine. And then suddenly the implant crowns come loose or the abutments fractured. And you look to see, and the photographs show that actually the teeth in front and behind have worn. These patients have materials haven't worn at equal rates. The materials haven't worn at equal rates, and suddenly the implant crown has become proud. There's no periodontal ligament. Suddenly the entire occlusion is pivoting on this implant crown. Bang. So as after you've done all of this and you've restored the patient, it doesn't end there. Every single checkup must also incorporate is the occlusion still stable? Is the temporomandibular the joint still in the right place? Can you still get centric relation? Have you still got even contacts around the arch? Have you still got guidance? That, that allows posterior instant posterior disclusion. Have you still got the balance and function that you built in, you know, when you did the rehab, when you did the rehab mm-hmm. and for this reason, we don't get, we only guarantee our work if the patient is coming back at least once a year. Usually we said, we, we, well, depending on their level, we set it when I write the letter and it's usually twice a year for checkups and four times a year for hygiene, but it can go up and down based on that patient's level of stability or instability in the past. If they don't conform with that and they come back to me three years later and say, well, this crown's now broken and I've got a five-year guarantee on it. Well, actually, you don't have a five-year guarantee on it if you haven't come back to the checkups. 100%. Because things change. Patients change. Patients' functions change. Somebody who is a very calm person may have started a new job where they're highly stressed and they've suddenly started bruxing and clenching. And you, have, you didn't have that two or three years ago. So you've got to keep the observation. We observe if they got new carries, if they got new periodontal disease, have they got new occlusal disease? Have they got stability? What you're talking about is the thing 
the, the thing the thing that's key with this is like we always say jazz it's relationships isn't it it's yeah. about keeping mm-hmm. consistent relationships because you can't stepping stone dentistry by the way is something i'm going to steal off of you i'm going to quote i'm going to quote <laughs> that to my patients because i think that's very very important that it, you instill it in their minds that they cannot go from zero to hero they have to take every single step that's appropriate but you're also doing something very key along the uh, the same time which is that you're building a relationship and mutual trust and respect with that person so that you get to know what they're about and you're never going beyond your competence level and you're never taking them into something which you don't in your heart of hearts think is right for them. So you can kind of, as long as it's a safe stepping stone to stop on, you don't offer the rehab. Do you see what I mean? Is that fair to say? I agree. Yeah. I agree. Corey, I'm going to get bombarded uh, by the end of this episode with people wanting to know about your occlusion course. Um, is it just in, in, in London or at multiple locations? And can you just give us some details about at that? At the moment, it is just in London. Obviously, because we've come out of lockdown, we've not really had anything concrete laid down. And the, and the only times we've managed to do is is, is at the practice um, and somewhere close to the practice where we do the lectures. Um, but we, you need hands-on for this. So you, it needs to be at yep. the practice. Um, so I, I run it with Shiraz Khan. We run it together. Um, because there's obviously a lot of elements involved in um, especially patients who are sort of doing um, general practitioner orthodontics and and aesthetics and lengthening anterior teeth and this sort of thing really needs to have a a good foundation in occlusion. But the bottom line to end all of this off is diagnose it, see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How you treat it is another matter, but if you don't diagnose it, you're doing yourself and the patient a disservice. And when you've diagnosed it, A, you feel much better in yourself. You sleep better at night. But also the process of going through this is also a, it's a, it's a lucrative treatment option. It's like, you know, oh, I make more and more implants. You know, people say, oh, well, I do implants because I make more money. No, it's, it's not like that. This is a valid treatment diagnost- diagnostic and treatment process that also will fill your book and allow you a stability of your patient base that means your book isn't filled with emergency with Mrs. Smith's front crown has come off again and Mr. Smith's fractured his lower six again after the third time. You, this actually gives you control over your entire patient population. I, do, I mean, I do four mouth three abs, but I do a lot of general dentistry as well. I, you know, I get patients who come in, you need know, four composites and an endo and, and one crown, you know, that's fine. But they still go through the same, you know, they still go through the same occlusal analysis process. For, for me, Corey, dentistry becomes fun when you're moving away from single tooth dentistry and, and, and having the, yeah. the comprehensive exam and the knowledge of working knowledge of occlusion uh, is, is the basis for you to have more fun because it allows you to move away from single tooth dentistry. And that's why I got into uh, learning about occlusion. So um, please do send me the dates and the website. I'm going to love to stick it in the show notes because I'm sure people would love, learn from, website, love to learn more. The website you. is, is www.lciadacademy.com dot co dot uk perfect we also we also run photography so i think photography is an integral part of this we run a separate photography course with shiraz and also a an occlusion course with shiraz and i think the two of them those two courses actually will i want i want i, I gave a lecture to the scandinavian academy on this over a, a one-day period and i actually stood up in front of them and said what i'm going to say today is going to change your life all right and i did it with tongue in cheek But it really did because people said, I'm now going to look at my patients in a different way. I'm going to see stuff I didn't see before. I'm not going to fall into holes I fell in before. And I'm going to have far more control over the the work I do than I did before. And the genuine, the genuine, you know, I got bought a lot of beers at the end of the night because some of them (laughs) said, no one's ever, I've been in practice 10 years. No one's ever taught me this before. And Mm -hmm. I see all the stuff you showed. I know which patient you showed me that. You know, Mrs. So-and-so has that. You showed me this. I know why Mr. So-and-so's crowns failed. You showed me that. I know why that implant, you know, crown broke. And suddenly they get it. And when they get it, this little light comes on and suddenly they run back to the practices and, and, and they start seeing things that they didn't see before. And that to me is the epitome of, is, is, is the epitome of teaching. It's about showing people they've, something they've never seen before. Amazing. 
Brilliant. Uh, Croy, thank you so much for giving up your time today. I know how busy you are uh, and on holiday as well. Uh, <laughs> it's so great to have you on and uh, you're a fountain of knowledge and it's uh, great to share your passion. Uh, just like you inspired me in 2013, I'm sure you inspired hundreds uh, others now listening to Chris Rati, uh, about this very That's geeky you. Don't topic. That's yourself, Dan. You've been fantastic. Both of you. Uh, Zach, you as well, my friend. Thanks so much, buddy. Likewise, bud. Well played. Thank you, Corey. Thanks, guys. So there we have it, guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. You now know about that dark, evil side of equilibration. I mean, I can count on one hand how many equilibrations I've done because in my previous working experience, I've been influenced by hospital-based dentistry uh, and a lot of the, the TMD literature, which is made in hospitals, is very much like controversial, like, hey, don't do equilibration because uh, this is not uh, effective according to the studies, but the studies themselves are not very high quality. So I do think there is a role. Like in everything, we have to you know keep our minds mind open. Everything has this place, okay? Uh, although it's not mainstream, I do think equilibration has a role. In fact, I'm investing in a T-scan. I've just bought a T-scan uh, and I can see equilibration becoming more and more into my practice, especially as I uh, take on bigger cases uh, and as much of a controversial area it is, you have to keep an open mind to it. So that's my philosophy anyway. I, you know, I like to listen to everyone and make up my own mind and my own practice. And I think it, it would be great to contribute to practice, uh, to research one day. I was actually emailing Riaz Yar the other day and I said, listen, I want to contribute to research. How how can I test my splint theories? How can I produce some TMD data? How can I produce some outcomes based on, hey, can equilibration help or can this certain, this type of splint be proven for this diagnosis, e.g. myofacial pain? So I'm always thinking about it. So if anyone out there, actually, I'm just this is my plea to you. If anyone out there is involved in research and practice, I would love to do some of that. So please get in touch with me. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. The next episode will be on uh, planning your CPD and not burning out. So you know it's going to be a cracker. I'll Catch you then. <laughs>